Mayor Mike Duggan. Wow. Well, thank you. Not bad. <laughs> uh, I hope you're still uh, clapping for me like this a year from now. <laughs> uh, I got to tell you, it's, it's pretty exciting for me to stand up here as the, the newsmaker of the year. A year ago, I was nominated in the finalists, and a very uh, worthy uh, winner, Nancy Schlichten, got the award. But it was the fifth time I had been nominated and lost. <laughs> and so my friend Keith Crane called me and said, Mike, I got good news for you. You set a record. You have been a finalist who didn't win more than anybody in Crane's history. He told me I was the Buffalo Bills of the Crane's Newsmaker of the Year. And I said, Keith, what's it going to take for me finally to win? He says, well, one of these years you'll do something really newsworthy. Uh, and I'm glad... Uh, that I was finally able to make it and to, to have it uh, be, be kicked off by my friend uh, Ralph McDowell. Uh, Bodman uh, was my attorneys for this last year, and they were behind the extremely clever strategy that when Tom Barrow sued to get me thrown off the ballot, they managed to lose the case <laughs> so that I would have enormous sympathy and could run as a writer. <laughs> <laughs> the most creative lawyers in town, but they've been <laughs> phenomenal. Fortunately, they and Butch Hollowell and the rest of the team won all the rest of the cases when they tried to throw me off as a write in and challenge the outcome and have done just a, a phenomenal job. And I do appreciate the contribution of, uh, of Tom Lewand. Uh, and, you know, for those who are here, what a great set of people who were, who were also nominated this year, and one who isn't at the lunch is... Uh, Kevin Orr was nominated uh, and did not make it. And while with the others, I wish in a future year for you to be the winner. I hope Kevin Orr is not standing here uh, a year from now. Uh, uh, but it is, we have worked out what has been a really good relationship. And it wasn't easy. We spent hours together uh, with detailed conversations saying, and, and I have said this from the beginning, emergency managers in this state have failed repeatedly. And you've seen cities like Highland Park and Hamtramck and Ecorse cycle through again and again. Because a key part of what takes a turnaround is you got to put the right team in place, you got to get the right systems in place, and short-term good decisions only get you so far. And the interesting thing is that when I got elected, Governor Snyder, I think, pretty much agreed with that. He encouraged us to sit down, and we actually wrote out an agreement that said that Kevin Orr is running the bankruptcy side of things, restructuring the balance sheet, and I'm running uh, the day-to-day -day activities of the city outside uh, the police department. But the thing is, no matter what you put on paper, there isn't a clear dividing line. Because anything I do in running the city could cause a deficit that impacts on what he's doing in bankruptcy court. And what he puts into the plan of adjustment restricts what I do in running the city. And so we've spent an awful lot of time uh, coming to uh, common ground. And there is a plan of adjustment uh, in front of the court now, uh, and it does not keep the uh, pensioners whole, as I know everybody here uh, thinks they ought to be. It does not repay creditors who loaned us money in good faith, and it doesn't leave us very much money to run the city. In fact, if you look at the 10-year projection, it assumes just about everything goes right. It assumes that we grow income tax, that we grow state revenue sharing, and that we put dozens of cost-cutting initiatives in and every one of them work. And when I said to the emergency manager, you are assuming uh, that everything is going to go right, which is not the history of this city, he says, you're right. But what's your alternative? If you want to put more money in the future operations of the city, we've got to cut the pensioners even further. And is that the right thing to do? And so what the team that we have is signing up for is to take what is a very tight budget for several years and try to figure out how to do more with less. And I'm going to be here this afternoon to ask people in this room to help me in that effort. Because I can tell you right now, we don't have enough people in the city with enough restructuring experience. But we got a lot of people with a good heart. And I wanted to know 
where we stood. And I think many of you saw on January 1, I got sworn in. I went and I jumped on a, a snowplow with a snowplow driver because I've learned a long time ago. You want to know how a place is running. You sit and talk to the employees who are doing the job every day. And as I rode on the snowplow in that snowstorm, uh, I was amazed to see there's no GPS system on our snowplows. There's not so much as a radio system. They can't communicate with the person in the snowplow. They hand him a piece of paper and say to him, drive out Werner till you hit the Dearborn border, drive back, and then we'll give you a new piece of paper. Uh, that's the way we're operating. And as I, I drove with this person, an 18-year city employee, he tells me how he is making less money today than he did 10 years ago with the 10% pay cuts, the co-pays on the health care, et cetera. And in spite of that, the whole time, as he's working 12-hour shifts in a beat-up old truck, he's saying, but here's what we could do. If we would just change the way we deploy the drivers, it doesn't make any sense for me to go all the way out in the Dearborn border and come back. I should take these other routes over here. And if we could coordinate our scheduling this way. This guy, in 18 years, was still thinking about how to make it better. And I said, well, what happens when you tell your supervisor these ideas? And he started laughing. He said, you haven't been here very long. He says, <laughs> he says that conversation would not be welcome with our supervisors. And I thought, isn't this a huge part of the problem? These employees are seeing their jobs privatized. They know what's wrong. They want to make changes, and they don't have the ability to do it. So I did what I knew how to do. I started scheduling employee forums, asking employees their opinions, and every place I've been. I found employees deeply engaged, lots of ideas on how to fix things. I went and hired Mary Martin, who headed up lean processing for the Detroit Medical Center. She was at the, the center of everything we did to redesign our system and cut costs. She's coming in here full time. And I said, all right, let's start with the ambulances. Because I'm obsessive about measuring things, and less than 10% of the time do our ambulances show up uh, within the national standard. This is a life and death issue. And she starts to take apart the different pieces. And she comes back and says to me, we got a dispatch system that is literally seven generations behind. We have no meaningful way of sending people to the most efficient places. We got to get in a new dispatch system. And I go down to Louisville and get our new technology officer, uh, Beth Niblock. And she's going to come up, but that's going to take a year. I said, what about every day? And she starts to tear apart the work. And this is what restructuring is about. And in a 12-hour shift, if you can imagine this, our EMTs are on these ambulances 12 hours at a time. Imagine the heroic effort that takes every day. In a 12-hour shift, we found they spend an average of four hours at a hospital. And if you watch Grey's Anatomy, the EMS comes in, drops them off, gets out, and leaves. <laughs> That's not really what happens. Uh, the EMS has got to do a formal handoff to the emergency room doctors. And what I've learned, and this is kind of how I am, I'm kind of obsessed about this stuff, is once you drop them off, we've got a stretcher. We've got to strip the linens off the stretcher, we've got to wipe down the stretcher, you've got to put it back in the car. Except when the patient's still on the stretcher, you're not going anywhere. Uh, now sometimes the patient is so critical that you need to wheel them in on our stretcher and do procedures right there, but most of the time that patient is stable. And so Mary's working with the hospitals. As soon as we get in, if the patient's stable, Move the patient from the ambulance stretcher to the hospital stretcher. Let's get the stretcher back out. Let's clean the linens. Let's get it out onto the truck. And the other thing is, if our EMTs have provided medication to the patient on the way, that medication has to be replaced by the hospital pharmacy dispensing it. And depending on which hospital we're at, you could have to go to the other end of the building to get the meds refilled. And so we're losing four hours out of a 12-hour shift with our EMS people at the hospital. She's already working with the employees to restructure the system so we can come in, get the meds dispensed at the emergency room, get the stretchers back on. We now believe we can cut two hours a shift off of their time, which is like putting three or four more ambulances on the road with the same amount of money. If we're going to come back, this is what we need to do. The other problem is we're having a terrible time maintaining these ambulances. But we are not repairing them the way we should be. So I go to the garage. I meet with the employees. What do we got to do to do vehicle repairs? And they say, let us show you the part ordering system. 
They said 20% of the parts we need are not even in the computer database. We go to order them, it takes forever. We've had vehicles wait days for a new door handle to come in. And so, obvious answer, right? We need to privatize the parts operation. Except I found out the parts operation has already been privatized. It's the private company that's got the system. And the workers say the same thing. If we just took the time to restructure our inventory system so every part was in the system, we wouldn't have mechanics standing around when we need to get them on the road. And so now, in order to get the EMS to respond, we got to restructure the parts ordering system. And then I said to Mary, OK, what's next? We need people. We don't have nearly enough drivers. We need 670 more EMTs. And we're hiring them this weekend at a job fair. I said, well, that's great. Let's go hire them. And so I so said, well, at HR, it's going to be four months. I said, well, that sounds reasonable. Four months for training uh, in EMT in Detroit, that's reasonable. I said, oh, no, the four-month training period is later. Uh, before we can train them, it takes us four months to hire them. And so I've got to go see the HR people, right? <laughs> OK, guys, why does it take four months to hire a new city employee? They're like, Mike, we're glad you're here. Let's show you. And so they walk me in to the testing room in the city HR department, and it is beautiful, state of the art, 30 computers on long benches, brand new testing thing. You can see where, the, where uh, our new applicants can come in and be tested and the like. And I'm watching the applicants, and they're sitting in these beautiful computers, and they're sitting on the bench. They got a paper and a pencil, and they're writing the answers on the paper and the pencil. The 30 computers aren't even turned on. And I said, guys, and they said, here's our problem. They put in a state-of-the-art testing system, but nobody ever trained the workers. For two years, we've been asking for training. It takes eight days to get through the grading of these tests because you hire 70 people. Of course, 700 apply, and you got a lot of other people. We're losing eight days in the process because nobody stopped and worked out the training aspect. And so now we've got a team working on that. And here's what I'm finding. Our employees are dying to do this. And when I say to them, have you ever been on a lean processing team? Have you ever been on a Six Sigma team? They don't know what I'm talking about. This is a totally foreign language. But I tell you what, they are dying to learn because every one of them knows that their job depends upon delivering service efficiently. They know this city's future depends on having people move into the city, not move out. And that means better city services. And so when I say to them, tell me your biggest problem, uh, with, with the city, they say, our supervisors. Uh, they say that in front of the supervisors. It's the darndest thing. <laughs> I say, how do you pick them at DPW? How do you pick your supervisors? By seniority. I said, really? This is a whole 200 union members. I said, how many of you think picking by seniority is a good idea? Not a hand in the room goes up. They now realize that if you continue to run inefficient operations, the jobs are going to be privatized. And so the question is, well, how should we pick them? And we really have some very candid conversations. And I said, at DMC, if you wanted to be a supervisor, you had to have actively participated in a lean process. You had to be part of taking the emergency room from 30 minutes to 29 minutes. If you wanted to be a supervisor, you had to be an active participant. How many of you think that's fair? Everybody says, I'd love to participate. And so here's going to be my first ask of the people in this room. I'm going to build a culture where we value continual process improvement, where we value employee input. And Mary has got a team of four or five people to do it. But we're going to need help. And what I would ask of you is this. If your company is involved, whether you call it Six Sigma, Lean Processing, Continuous Process Improvement, if your company has as one of its core skills the ability to tear apart a process, get the employees involved in redesigning it, and measure the outcome, we need your help. And I hope we put cards on the table. But what I would ask you to do is, if you would, I'd like you to take one project. Okay? That project could be part of something big, like police response time, or how we respond to the water main breaks in this city, which makes uh, no sense at all. It could be how we get vehicles towed more quickly. It could be how we extend youth soccer to more kids in the city to give them something to do. But I'm looking for people who will sign up and come in for a month or two and pick one project and work with our employees 
so that we can start to train our own employees on what lean processing is. We've got to build the capacity in-house. And so I'm not doing what's traditionally done and ask somebody to loan me an executive, uh, with the exception of Bodman. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm not asking you to loan me an executive, because I've been on the other side of that, and oftentimes you loan the guy you didn't really know what to do with. Uh, and so, <laughs> so, so, so uh, apparently I hit a nerve with a couple of you. <laughs> uh, uh, but what I'm saying is I want your best people to come work with us for a month or two and pick one process. If 10 companies in this room would help us design one process better and we can then train our own employees in the future, you could have a long-term effect on the service in the city of Detroit. And one of the most critical things we have to do that has to do with efficiency, and this is going to be my second ask, we have got to deal with the issue of the, the unsavory scrap metal dealers in the city of Detroit. And there is a bill right now, House Bill 4593. It has been pushed by the Detroit Crime Commission. David Cotton, the chair of the commission, is up here on the stage. Andy Arena, the former FBI director, has been pushing it. The Michigan Association of Police Chiefs has been pushing it and they haven't been getting any help. In the last couple of weeks, uh, I've joined in with my team in a very aggressive way, and we need you, and here's the issue. In any year, we have at least 5,000 cases of theft, of copper, of air conditioning units, and the like. Uh, they are tearing apart the houses in our neighborhoods. If you drive down a street in Detroit, look at the rooftops of the stores. You will see on many rooftops fences with barbed wire cages over the air handling units. They are having, the businesses in this town, are having to fence in their rooftop air handling units because they're being so brazenly stolen. And it oftentimes costs you twice as much as a business owner to open your business in Detroit with the insurance than in the suburbs. We had four schools go down two weeks ago, out of school for two or three days, because they stole the power lines that were feeding those schools. And the terrible thing is, you could cost, it could cost you twenty, fifty, dollars $100,000 $100, to replace what's torn out, and they're getting cents on the dollar. I've spent an awful lot of time with our police detectives. You have a number of very fine and reputable scrapyards. You also have some who are not. And we need to deal with the difference. We can chase 5,000 scrappers around the city, but there are 14 scrapyards in the city and another five or six on our border. And so when I talk to the detectives and I say, what's going on? They said, here's what you have. You have the same people coming into the scrapyard day after day with uh, wirings from households, with hot water heaters like. Same person day after day showing up. You think they don't know? The same crews day after day with roof air handling units showing up and selling them. In some cases, we've put out theft notices. So we had the theft of some Cadillac converters from an auto plant here. Put out a theft notice. Our police a month ago went in and did a surprise inspection. They found a bin of the stolen catalytic converters in the scrapyard right under the theft notice sign posted on the wall. In other cases, they've gone in and found the, the scrapyards peeling off the cover off the copper wire because I, it identifies the wire as DTE in order to make it unrecognizable. Now, the outrageous bill that the scrap industry is vigorously fighting, that David Cotton has pushed, does two things. It says, one, that if you go into a scrapyard and sell a catalytic converter, an air conditioning unit, or copper wire, only those three things, that you cannot just pay that person on the spot. You either need to mail a check to their house, or they have to come back three days later and pick it up. Make sense? So what's happening today is they walk in, they dump the stuff, they get essentially an ATM card, which they cash on the site, take the cash out, and there's no trace of who they are and how often they're coming in. And so we're saying, okay, not for all the scrap, just three things. There is no reason a typical demolition company should be coming in with catalytic converters, okay? Catalytic converters, copper wires, air handling units, you either mail the check to them or you wait three days. 
Nearly half the states in America have those restrictions. They're being fought. Then we have a second piece. We are asking the sellers to take a clear image, a picture, with a clear image of the seller. That is, all we want is a clear image of the person who came in and sold it to you for those individuals. Two things. You would think when David Cotton pushed that forward and, and, and the crime commission and the police chiefs that that would be an easy sell. And yet, they have so far blocked us. The interesting thing is, we've got great bipartisan support. On the House side, a Republican, Paul Muxlow, and a Democrat, Rashida Tlaib from Detroit, with the support of our speaker, Jace Bolger, have been trying to get this done. On the Senate side, a Republican senator by the name of Mike Kowal, a Detroit senator by the name of Virgil Smith, and our majority leader, Randy Richardville, have been trying to get this done. Governor Snyder has been supportive in trying to get this done. But it's gotten so little publicity that the scrap dealers fighting these two things are continuing to succeed. These issues are going to come up to vote in the next couple weeks. And so I have one other ask of you. If you've got a relationship with any state rep or any state senator, just call or email them and say, this is important to us. We need to make sure we can enforce this. Because you think about what we're doing. I'm about to seize hundreds of abandoned houses and start to sell them on the internet for people to fix them up. But if every time they start to fix them up, somebody comes in and strips the stuff out, who's going to come into the city? And so this is the way that I'm approaching things. Uh, my friend Keith Crane says uh, that he was uh, on the board of DMC uh, when they hired me. And you probably tell from his tone he was somewhat skeptical of that hiring decision. Uh, and, and at the time, DMC, the board had previously voted to close Hutzel Hospital, voted to close Receiving Hospital. We were down to 15 days cash on hand. And after 60 days, I came back to the board because I met with the employees. I looked in their eyes. I saw what they were willing to do. And I said, I think we can keep these hospitals open. I think we can turn it around. Because I've seen what's actually going on here. And DMC is not as far away from being turned around as it looks. And I can tell you, having spent the first two months with the city of Detroit employees, the city of Detroit is not as far away from being turned around as it looks. But if you could help us on these two things, if you've got the skill to help us develop the lean capability, if you've got a relationship with a Republican senator or House member on the scrap bills, if you could pitch in and help us, it would make a difference in this city for years to come. Thank you all very much.